It is the 12th century. In a field in northern France, two armies of heavily armed knights oppose one another on their steeds. A battle cry, Dex I, or God our help, breaks out and a charge ensues. Lances, swords and horses crash against chainmail, metal and flesh, and hours of desperate fighting commence. But instead of a mighty battle, the assembled knights have no intention of killing their foes, and instead hope to capture and ransom their prisoners. In a mass tournament in which Europe's fighting men gather to test their mettle, so it was that from amongst them would rise to fame and fortune a man many consider to be the greatest knight that ever lived. His name, William Marshall, the Perfect Knight. The man known to history as William Marshall was born around the year 1146 or 1147, most probably at Hampstead Marshall Castle in Berkshire, England. Marshall's father, John Marshall, was born around 1105 and held a position of minor influence under King Henry I as the Master Marshal, a privilege for which he paid 40 silver marks. He was a somewhat pious and moralistic minor noble who was willing to ally himself to the winning side for his own gain. William's mother was Sybil of Salisbury. She came from a rival noble family, and John married her in either 1141 or 1142, their marriage bringing an end to the division which existed between their families at the time. She was the sister of Patrick of Salisbury, a noble born in 1126 who played a vital pastoral role for William in the absence of fatherly affection from John, and it was noted by many that William remained close to his mother, who cared for him deeply. William Marshall was the second son of Sybil and John, but little is known of William's childhood, although as he was cut out of his family's will, education was the only solace afforded to him at this time, and he was sent to Normandy to learn under William of Tuncarville in 1160 when he was a teenager. William of Tuncarville was the lord of an imposing Norman castle, and was famed as the father of knights due to his willingness to fund and educate warriors in the developing art of knighthood. William Marshall decided against entering the priesthood, and instead began his training in order to become a knight, a profession which had only relatively recently become a separate, noble discipline and vocation within medieval society. Knights were expected to be exceptional in a variety of ways, wise and canny in their advice, proficient in their military and political planning, as well as dedicated to the noble code of chivalry, and talented and fierce in their combat ability. This was a profession open to all who could gain funding in the feudal structure. Although once instituted as a knight, the position came with a noble status, as knights were viewed as elite warriors and counsellors. Funding was the most essential element for any trainee or fully-fledged knight. War horses alone cost four or five times the average annual salary to maintain, let alone purchase. In addition to the massive costs incurred in the purchase of armour, weaponry and subsistence, it was thus usually only possible for sons of noble families with accumulated wealth. William was successful in gaining the financial patronage of Tuncarville, and joined with him in his retinue of knights, who were expected to act as bodyguards and counsel to their master. And throughout his education, William was remembered for his appetite, gaining the nickname Greedy Guts from his fellow initiates, and later stated himself that he had been a lazy teenager, more concerned with sleep and food than with study. Regardless, William demonstrated a talent for this profession of violence and excelled in its various aspects, from learning to read and perhaps write in Latin to engaging in jousting and hand-to-hand -hand combat. William was also bestowed with the tools of the trade, a large, disciplined warhorse, a sword, chainmail and plated armour, a jousting lance, a helm and a shield, all of which served as an additional badge of office for this elite band of warriors. 1166 saw William Marshall complete his training and become invested as a knight after a ritual of knighthood. The situation in Normandy was tense that year, and William was soon to put his skills to the test in the field of battle. Normandy had become enthralled in a violent dispute with the neighbouring provinces of Boulogne, Ponthieu and Flanders, 
and although the background to the conflict is not known, it soon burgeoned into an armed engagement. Tancarville sent his retinue of knights 55 miles east to deal with an invasion of Norman territory at neufchatel en bray alongside the constable of Normandy and his troops. The fortress at Neufchatel walled in a small town and lay next to the river Bethune, 15 miles back from the Norman border with the duchies of Flanders and Ponthieu. The plan was for the Norman forces to attack the enemy line once they had all gathered at the castle, although the hostile coalition undermined this when they launched a preemptive attack and breached the Norman fortress at Neufchatel itself. The defenders remained calm, and 28 knights, including William, were ordered to advance from the castle and engage enemy forces on the outskirts of the city. William was eager to fight, and broke formation on the right to the front line to pull ahead of everyone else. Although he was scolded and ordered to return to his position, William did not have long to wait, as a few moments later, a hostile band of knights was spotted coming up the street ahead of the column. Both sides charged, and the clashing of metal on metal mingled with the shouts of anger, fear and pain was termed by one contemporary chronicler as the sound of God's thunder. William proved himself in his first engagement, and after splintering his lance in a ferocious attack, advanced forth with his sword, dealing incredibly powerful downward strikes for which he would soon become universally feared. The success of the battle varied for the Normans during the day, and although they repelled four attacks on the city, the enemy kept up their assault. But during the afternoon, William found that he was left behind after his own side had retreated and was therefore in enemy territory alone. He remained unfazed and charged down a street crying, Tonkarville, which emboldened his own sight so much that they took up arms and charged toward the enemy after him, although William was later wounded when he tried the trick again and ran into 13 Flemish soldiers, one of whom barbed him on a thatching hook. This unfortunate engagement led to the slaughter of his prized warhorse and damaged his armor, both of which remained essential elements of his knightly complement. He also made another elementary mistake when he neglected to take any prisoners or seize any booty from the battlefield, both of which provided vital income for a knight. The battle at Neufchatel lasted a single day, as many engagements of the time did, and after its conclusion, the situation in Normandy cooled down and the conflict petered out. Following the conclusion of hostilities, William of Tonkarville sought to reduce the size of his retinue and earmarked William Marshall for expulsion, as he was an inexperienced knight, who had thus far failed to bring him any income from the battlefield. In a final blow to William, the Chamberlain of Tonkarville refused to furnish him with a new warhorse or suit of armor, leaving him without the vital assets he required to join another retinue of knights, and thus starting the first major crisis of William's adult life. There remained but a single avenue for William, the knightly tournament circuit. The tournament circuit was a burgeoning but already huge part of medieval knightly life and attracted warriors from all over Europe to participate in events held across northern France. And during the mid to late 12th century, the scene was reaching its peak. They were dangerous affairs and had led to the death and injury of some participants, but they also offered unrivaled opportunity for wealth, fame and repute bestowed on those who gained success in the event. When William heard that Tonkarville intended to attend a tournament in Saint-Jean-sur-Sath with 40 of his knights, he contacted the Chamberlain to ask if he could attend with the retinue as an associate, to which the Chamberlain agreed, and reluctantly furnished him with new armor and a regular horse. Tournaments would be played out over areas 30 miles square and could involve hundreds of knights who would form two teams, generally French versus Angevin who would engage in combat against one another, both in formal pitched melees and then over the terrain. With the use of tactics such as ambushes, William Marshall entered the tournament field astride his horse and gathered in the Norman and Angevin ranks. Silence followed. The call of a hunting horn was quickly followed by the Norman battle cry, Dexai, meaning God our help, and the side was off, charging toward their opponents, who in turn charged forth toward them. William fought splendidly and marked himself out as a talented warrior, managing to capture two opposing knights, the second after he had grabbed the reins of his horse, an incredibly tricky feat, which William nonetheless performed perfectly. 
The fortune gained from the tournament changed William's circumstance overnight, leaving him with four war horses, cash, and an array of equipment, all given as a ransom payment for the knights he had captured. And for the next year and a half, William continued to fight on the tournament circuit, generally with great success. It was not until 1167 or 1168 that William would travel back to England, the first time that he had returned home for around eight years. William rode for the West Country as soon as he reached England, and visited his living relatives, as well as his father's grave, as he had died in 1165. After he had concluded these visits, William contacted his uncle, Earl Patrick of Salisbury, who maintained a retinue of knights numbering between 50 and 60 at any given time. Patrick offered William a place, and was introduced to his new position in the same year. In 1168, Patrick was called to bring himself and his retinue to southwestern France, to fight alongside King Henry II himself in a new conflict which had emerged against insurgents in Aquitaine. Whilst William had studied in France, Henry II had performed well as a monarch, establishing a new and centralized judicial system after the terror of the anarchy, and had regained control over the minting of coinage, allowing formal taxation to be resumed. He had been aided no end in his rule by his wife, Eleanor of Aquitaine who had previously been wed to the French king, Louis VII, although she had married Henry after their separation in 1152. The marriage between Henry and Eleanor had given birth to the golden period of the Angevin dynasty, with the territories of Aquitaine added to the existing Angevin provinces, leaving Henry's empire the most powerful in Europe by the 1160s. Aquitaine, however, had become fractious with local warlords remaining loyal to Eleanor but not to Henry II, meaning that since their marriage, the supremacy of royal authority had declined, and arbitrary law had become the norm. Henry II thus placed effective control of the region in the hands of his wife, Eleanor of Aquitaine. William was recruited to form part of Eleanor's protection detail, and remained with her as part of her entourage when she toured the province. And in early April 1168, the Queen was travelling through the misty forests and foothills which surrounded Poitiers, with a retinue of knights and officials providing protection, a group which included William Marshall, and was headed by Patrick of Salisbury. Without warning, the column was ambushed by the heads of a rebel clan who had been defeated earlier that year in anti-insurgency operations, and a furious battle followed. Patrick shouted a warning to the Queen, and her carriage sped off towards Poitiers, leaving behind the retinue of unarmored knights to hold the road until Eleanor managed to reach a safe distance. Patrick charged toward the enemy to distract them from the escaping Queen, and was struck with a lance which went through his unarmored chest, thrusting him off his horse onto the road. Witnessing the death of their master, the knights flew into an almost manic rage, William attacking with a lance and then a sword, throwing numerous opponents from their mounts, and inflicting great damage on the enemy. He was eventually overwhelmed, and lanced in the back of his thigh, the weapon penetrating all the way through to the top of his leg. William fell to the ground, the dead body of his uncle and retinue leader lying a few meters in front of him, before he was dragged up and bound to the back of a wagon, now prisoner of a band of fugitives responsible for killing a state official. William was forced to endure months of captivity, with little to no treatment for his significantly wounded thigh. After a period of time, during which his leg was able to partially recover, news arrived that Eleanor of Aquitaine was willing to pay a ransom for the return of William Marshall. This was arranged, and William returned to Poitiers, and was rewarded for his service with a position in the Queen's retinue. The next two years of William's life remain relatively unknown, although it can be assumed that he refrained from participating in tournaments, instead turning to anti-insurgency operations in Aquitaine. And by 1170, he had developed a close relationship with the Queen, and became a trusted and significant part of her entourage. His status secured when he travelled with Eleanor back to England to witness the coronation of her son, the 15-year-old Henry, as King, on the 14th of June, 1170. Soon to be known as Henry the Young King, he had married the daughter of Louis VII, Marguerite, when aged just five, whereupon he and his two-year-old bride became a joke amongst the aristocracy of Europe. William and Henry forged a close alliance, and remained confidants of one another until the latter's death. Henry II had taken the decision to crown his son king during his lifetime, as an insurance measure, 
eager to prevent fractious conflict over succession. The major cause of the anarchy, his other sons, Richard and John, had been given control over Aquitaine and Brittany respectively. Henry the Young King became ever more frustrated with his lack of actual power, his father having refused to grant him any patronage beyond the title of king, and he gathered together his own retinue of knights, including William Marshall. But by 1172, it became apparent that young Henry lacked the financial means to support his entourage, and it was at this time that he sought to actively seize power for himself. In November of 1172, young Henry travelled to meet with Louis VII of France to discuss potential tactics of rebellion. After he returned from Paris, young Henry attended a conference of nobles called by his father, and had an enraged outburst in front of the assembled dignitaries, before fleeing the castle in the dead of night, fearing that his father knew of his impending insurrection. He travelled once again to Paris, and was joined by his brothers, Richard and Geoffrey, as well as William Marshall, pulling together a powerful alliance of nobles, including King William of Scotland and Count Matthew of Boulogne. Armed combat soon followed in June 1173, young Henry spearheading an invasion of Normandy from France. The rebellion gained little overall success, and failed to capture the capital city of Rouen, or the city of Neufchâtel, the site of William's first battle, both of which had been key strategic targets for the rebels. The abortive invasion eventually led to a stalemate, with Eleanor of Aquitaine captured by Henry II's forces as she attempted to join her sons in France, giving him two key prisoners, Eleanor and the wife of young Henry, Marguerite. The failure to make headway in France forced young Henry to make a rash decision to invade England itself. 300 men of the rebel force landed at East Anglia in May 1174 and managed to capture the city of Norwich, a move which struck Henry II with fear, forcing him to rush back to England. And soon after he arrived in July, news reached the king that the rebel King William of Scotland had been captured. The momentum from this victory spurred the king on and he had soon defeated all the rebel forces in England, closely followed by the surrender of the insurgents in France after they failed to capture Rouen. But regarding his son's action, Henry II was magnanimous. Although the young king was forced to travel the kingdom under the watchful eye of his father, a time of virtual imprisonment which William recalled as incredibly dull. Young Henry eventually managed to convince his father to allow him to enter the tournament circuit in France, and he hurriedly departed for the continent. Finally feeling free, the tournament circuit would change the lives of William and young Henry forever. And despite their initial lack of success, the tournament team assembled by William and Henry became renowned for their prowess in battle, their close communication, and their tenacity and ferocity in attack. It was later claimed that their group captured over 500 knights during their tournament careers, and by the end of 1177, they remained one of the most famous band of knights in Europe, gaining immense wealth and repute for their unparalleled success. William and Henry grew incredibly close, and William was promoted above everyone else in the retinue to become the chief representative of Henry's military entourage, and his closest friend, young Henry, became known as the patron and head of the finest retinue of knights in Europe, and was hailed as the father of chivalry, the embodiment of the values upheld by knights everywhere at that time. William too had become a celebrity, and was made a knight banneret, allowing him to fly his own standard of battles, a red Norman lion on a background of green and yellow. Such was their success, both were selected to represent the Angevin Empire at the coronation of the French king, Philip II in late 1179, arriving in a fleet of carriages bearing immense gifts of gold and silver, with William heading a retinue of 80 of the kingdom's greatest knights. The death of Louis VII and the crowning of Philip II brought young Henry and Henry II together in a shared bid to increase Angevin influence in the new French court. This was only a temporary measure, however, and the young king grew progressively more frustrated at his situation throughout the 1170s, and by 1182 he was yearning for another rebellion. In 1182, young Henry was called to put down a rebellion in Aquitaine, then under the control of his brother Richard, and used this opportunity to make connections with other warlords who remained angry at Henry II. 
Despite his campaigning, a second insurrection emerged in the autumn of 1182, and Henry was left to decide whether he should join its ranks. His decision-making was rudely interrupted when he was informed of a rumour that his closest friend, William Marshall, had bedded his wife, Marguerite. Whilst there is no solid evidence either way as to whether or not this is true, it seems, on balance, unlikely that William actually performed such acts with Marguerite, as whilst adultery was common amongst medieval nobles, there is no evidence of Marshall ever entertaining a mistress or sexual partner of any kind other than his wife, and it has been concluded by many scholars that this was a rumour made up by William's rivals in order to ruin his close friendship with Henry. Indeed, young Henry seemed not to genuinely believe the rumours, as he did not punish or expel William as would have been expected, but merely treated him with cold detachment. They played their last tournament together, just north of Paris, later in 1182, and William Marshall left the retinue of the young king of his own accord, undergoing a period of self-imposed exile and venturing on a pilgrimage to Cologne. Upon his return to France, William ran into young Henry's chamberlain on a road and was breathlessly informed that he was urgently needed by the side of the young king. In William's absence, young Henry had publicly declared that he would back rebel barons against his brother Richard's rule in Aquitaine, where his heavy-handed and often brutal approach to government had earned him many enemies. Henry had effectively declared war on his brother and left his father's castle to form his own army, knowing that he had to regain the support of his renowned friend, William Marshall. Richard proved a brutal opponent and executed an entire contingent of Breton militiamen who engaged his army near Poitiers. By the 10th of February 1183, Richard had advanced within 12 miles of Limoges, the base of Henry's army, setting up his frontline fortress at Aix. Henry II, sensing that a bloodbath could follow, travelled to Limoges to negotiate with his eldest son, although was fired upon by archers as he approached young Henry's castle, a move which motivated Henry II to put his full weight of support behind Richard. Richard and Henry II prepared for the next two weeks for their attack on Limoges, leaving young Henry with the growing realisation that he was out of his depth. Henry was forced to resort to looting abbeys for funds, and desperately moved to fortify Limoges before Henry II and Richard began to march on the city on March the 1st. Limoges was besieged until May, when Henry the young king, who had failed to capitulate, exhausted the resources of the opposition. During the siege, Henry had requested that William return to him, prompting a meeting between Marshal and Henry's chamberlain and his return to young Henry in May, after the siege was lifted. William's arrival gave Henry the confidence to go on the offensive, and he began to pursue the enemy south. Despite his finances being in ruin, the situation changed dramatically in May, however, when the young king contracted dysentery at Gisurge and became bedbound. Henry realised that his race was run and contacted his father to inform him of his impending demise. William and his associates waited with bated breath for the recovery of their master, although it became evident by the 7th of June that he was at the end of his life. After receiving absolution and the last rites, Henry turned to William and hailed him as his most intimate friend, and asked him to carry his cloak to the Holy Land of Jerusalem, after which young Henry died on the 11th of June, 1183. His death led to the collapse of the rebel movement in Aquitaine, and shocked many in the kingdom, not least his father, Henry II, who was devastated at the news of the loss of his son. William missed much of this fallout, as he was bound for the Holy Land to perform the final wish of his beloved master. The journey of near 2,000 miles was not to be underestimated, and the world which greeted William as he disembarked in the trading and port city of Acre in the Levant was a million miles away from the one he had left when he set out from Marseille in September. William travelled first to Jerusalem, heading southeast from the city of Acre, and arrived in the city a few days later. Upon his arrival, William headed to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which was supposedly built on the site of Christ's resurrection, and laid down young Henry's cloak at the altar. William spent a total of two years in the Levant, and whilst his other actions are unknown, it is generally accepted that he fought to defend the region's Latin territory from attack by Saladin, a warlord who threatened the Kingdom of Jerusalem. 
There was no significant fighting between the kingdom, ruled by Baldwin IV of Jerusalem and Saladin, as the latter would almost invariably withdraw his troops whenever threatened with a landed battle, eventually calling a truce in 1185, when his interests turned eastward toward the city of Mosul, and the kingdom that William left behind in mid-1185 was one of factionalism and division, the papacy demanding that European powers send troops in order to defend its territory in the Levant. Before he departed for England, William purchased two burial cloths, which he believed would aid him after he died, due to their providence in the Holy City, and soon after Marshall left, Saladin invaded Jerusalem, and having smashed the Latin army, seized control of the city, which eventually prompted the papacy to call for the Third Crusade. After his return in 1186, William presented himself to King Henry II, who duly appointed him a member of his household, instituting him into a position of great power. William's days of fighting in tournaments had ended, and he was now required to negotiate the workings of a royal court at the height of its power. The court travelled and lived in splendour, and were entertained by jesters, musicians and storytellers, all the while playing one against the other for the favour of the king. Marshall excelled at court life, and used tales of battles and tournaments to excite and intrigue his fellow courtiers, becoming a master of court etiquette, known as courtesy. William's performance in court gained him favour with the king, and he was soon awarded land and wealth at Cartmel in northwest England, affording him a castle, agrarian land, and a squire, John of Early, who at 15 was taken as a student and aide. This new status and position also allowed William to begin forming his own retinue of knights, which included John of Early, William Walleran, and Geoffrey Fitzrobert. By the late 1180s, war was once again brewing on the continent, and Henry II wrote to William, imploring him to ride with his retinue of knights in order to join the fight. William agreed, although demanded that he be rewarded for his help in combat, evidently viewing this war as a key opportunity for advancement. Regardless of his sustained willingness to go to war, Henry II was in poor health, and whilst William had been in the Levant, Richard the Lionheart had assumed the position of heir to the throne, with his younger brother John as the only other surviving heir. Richard was now plagued by the same grievances as Henry the Young King, as he was a man with status, but without power, and one who could easily ally himself with Philip of France, who had grown from a sickly child to a worthy and keen adversary. The first action between the Capetians and the Angevins was seen in 1187, after Philip invaded Berry, a territory between Aquitaine and southern France. The two sides squared up outside of the fortress of Châteauroux in June, for what could have been a massive pitched battle, but Richard managed to mediate a truce between Philip and Henry, leading to a disengagement on the 23rd. Richard then shocked the Angevins, when instead of riding back to his own side to announce the truce, he rode back with Philip. In what was an evident sign of friendship, the Lionheart was eventually called back, but on the condition that he would not be kept in the same limbo as his brother. Two weeks after the battle at Châteauroux, the Christian world was rocked by the news that Saladin had captured Jerusalem. The event led to another truce, this time until June 1188, which was shattered when Philip invaded Berry once again, this time capturing the fort at Châteauroux. Henry II furiously responded by calling together a huge army, including thousands of Welsh mercenaries, and marched to France. William's aid was evidently of great value, and he was promised the coveted castle of Châteauroux in the event that the French could be pushed back. The Angevins had great success in their new campaign, and pushed the French army back at passy sur air and then at Breval, enacting a ruthless scorched-earth policy and taking vast amounts of booty. Despite these successes, the overall balance of the war remained inconclusive, and Henry II progressively withdrew behind the line to Le Mans, his health beginning to seriously fail. The onset of winter drove both sides to reconcile, and a conference was called for November in order to settle their differences. Richard, still angered at his father, arrived alongside Philip, and refused to accept Henry's terms, which left him out in the cold politically. Intelligence then arrived 
that Richard had written 200 letters to Angevin warlords in order to coordinate an insurrection. Henry II left the conference devastated, his health in ruin, and his son a traitor. William remained by the side of his king and was generously rewarded for his loyalty with the castle at Chateauroux, as well as a new ward in England under the possession of Lady Isabel of Clare, a wealthy and beautiful woman aged around 18. By early 1189, Henry was considering another peace conference, now strongly backed by the papacy, who wanted both sides to reconcile in order that they might join together in the Third Crusade. The conference failed, and the Capetian force launched a massive invasion of Angevin land, reaching the outskirts of the regional centre, Le Mans, in summer 1189. William was tasked with heading the defence of the city, and he rode out early on the 11th of June, a misty morning, with a small scouting party. He spotted a few Frenchmen, and held back his band from attack, which was a good decision, as a further moment's waiting revealed the entire French army advancing toward the city, no more than half a mile away. The army made camp in sight of the city, and both sides spent the day preparing for the coming battle on the 12th of June. On the day of the battle, William was ordered to defend the South Gate, and was perturbed to learn that the city's outer defences had been breached. Henry was extracted to safety, with William left to hold back the advancing French armies, leading to an inconclusive but bloody melee. Henry II retreated with a small band out of the city, William now at his side. But on hearing the sound of hooves, the party turned to find that Richard himself was bearing down on his father. William performed an abrupt about turn, and charged toward the Lionheart, ramming his lance through the head of Richard's horse. Richard pleaded for mercy, and William heeded him, leaving him alive on the ground. Henry II escaped to Chinon Castle now in great physical pain, leaving his former city ruined and smoking in the control of the Capetians. And by the 4th of July, Henry realised that he was soon to die, and called a conference to come to terms with Philip and Richard. And despite his great pain, Henry remained standing to meet his enemies, and formed an agreement to peace. Richard was to be confirmed as successor, and the Capetians compensated with 20,000 marks. Henry then demanded a list of those nobles who had betrayed him and joined the Capetians, and was devastated to see the first name, John, his other son, who Henry believed had remained loyal to him, but only two days later, on the night of the 6th of July 1189, Henry died in agony, a stream of blood spouting from his mouth and nose. Richard was to be the next King of England, and met William in mid-July at Fontevraud Abbey, where Henry had been laid out. Richard forgave William for charging him off his horse, as he knew that as a king in a position of weakness, he needed a man like William Marshall more than ever. Richard sealed this new alliance by supporting William's pledge to marry Isabel of Clare, a move which made Marshall a powerful and fabulously wealthy member of the elite with access to Isabel's land and castles in Oxford, Reading, Ireland, and Wales, the two were married. And whilst theirs was initially a political union, a strong feeling of love developed, and William never apparently took a mistress, even though this was commonplace, and the two had ten children together. Richard was formally crowned king on the 3rd of September in Westminster Abbey, and once confirmed as king, immediately set about planning a new crusade to recapture Jerusalem, a campaign which William Marshall did not participate in. Fearful that he could perish in the crusade, Richard empowered John with castles and land, as well as blessing his marriage to Isabella of Gloucester, another wealthy heiress with influence in Bristol and Gloucester itself, in order that he be set as the heir to the throne without actually crowning him king, as Henry II had done with his first son. Richard left for the Levant on the 4th of July 1190, leaving William as a key member of the nobility, holding the fort in England. William dedicated much of this time to his family whilst Richard was gone, having his first child, William, in the same year. He was now a powerful noble in the southwest of England and in southern Wales, sponsoring the Abbey of Tintern and farming a swathe of land around the Severn Estuary, whilst developing his retinue of knights and keeping a staff in London. In early 1193, shocking news came from the continent that Richard had been imprisoned by Duke Leopold V of Austria on his journey back to England, an event apparently motivated by jealousy and spite after a dispute in the Levant between the two rulers. John was delighted, and assumed the unofficial role of king for himself, travelling to France in order to parley with Philip, 
paying homage to him for all of the Angevin's continental territory, and agreeing to marry Alice of France. Philip agreed, in return, to back John's pledge to be made King of England. Eleanor of Aquitaine led the monarchist faction in the absence of Richard, and was joined by William in the plight against John, and they were soon successful in negotiating the release of Richard. News of his brother's impending release left John in a panic, and he rushed to protect Philip, signing vast areas of Angevin land over to him in January 1194, including Neufchâtel, Dieppe, and Longueville, as well as at Tours and Loche. This action shifted the continental balance of power in favour of the Capetians, and reduced the Angevin Empire to a subordinate position. Richard hurried back to England, and arrived in February 1194, now faced with the task of reclaiming his kingdom. William had just captured Bristol Castle for the king when he returned, and the two met at Huntingdon, north of London. Richard had perfected the art of war in the Levant, and remained a brutal leader. The king set about regaining his kingdom with immediate effect, besieging Nottingham Castle and crushing it in a single day, on the 25th of March 1194. By the spring of 1194, Richard had consolidated his power base in England, and set about an invasion of his lost territory on the continent. After landing in Barfleur, Richard sped toward Lisieux and met his brother John, who threw himself at his brother's feet and begged for mercy, to which Richard obliged, allowing him to fight in the royal army. Philip had coordinated a massive siege against Vernoy, and was taken by surprise when William and Richard attacked his force from behind, breaking through the lines and reinforcing Angevin positions inside the castle, eventually forcing Philip to call the siege off. This immense victory convinced many local nobles to submit their forces to Richard, who was able to assemble a massive army as a consequence. The next four years saw a line of successes for Richard against the French, aided by William Marshall and the growing number of English knights. William was now entering his fifties, but he remained a powerful, if not somewhat reckless warrior, noted for his actions on the assault of the castle at Millie, where he climbed a battlement to save one of his comrades, whilst wearing full armour, smashing the helmet off an opponent with a single downward strike. By the end of 1198, the Angevin kingdom had managed to return to a position of political stability, with much of the lost land returned under the control of Richard. One key element of this new regime was maintaining control over the Vaxin region, which lay between Capetian and Angevin territory, and was retaken in 1196 by Richard, and was to be controlled by a massive military fortification on the Seine at Les Andelis, a structure placed under the command of William Marshall as a clear demonstration of his significant power under Richard. Richard. The next target was the castle at Chalou, where Richard attacked Philip's forces and made camp in order to facilitate the attack. The castle was besieged for three days, and was on the brink of collapse when a lone crossbowman, Peter Basilius, fired a bolt at Richard around dusk on the 26th of March 1199, which struck him in the shoulder. Richard's wound soon turned gangrenous, and he died a few days later on the 6th of April, after instructing William to take control of Rouen. William knew that he had to capture Rouen before the enemy learned of Richard's death, and attacked the city without having time to mourn, although it was reported that Marshall was privately consumed with violent grief upon hearing of the death of the king. The succession to the throne was now a contest between Richard's brother, John and his nephew, Arthur I of Brittany, a child who enjoyed favour in some parts of the continental Angevin kingdom for his status of primogenitor or preference for inheritance of the firstborn child, as he was the grandson of Henry II through his father Geoffrey, who had been the firstborn son but was illegitimate. Marshall remained supportive of John, considering that at a time of such crisis, an adult was a favourable choice over an untested child as king. William sent his aide and friend, John of Early, back to England to inform the domestic government of Richard's death, and travelled back himself alongside John toward the end of May 1199. On the 27th of May 1199, John was anointed and crowned king in Westminster Abbey, and after the ceremony, William was invested as an earl, the highest noble rank, assuming his final title as William Marshall, 1st Earl Pembroke, which gave him control over castles and land in Bristol and Gloucester, as well as the title of Sheriff of Gloucester. John became king at a time of turmoil, 
and was already unpopular. Due to his betrayal of both Henry II and Richard, he soon gained a bad reputation as a paranoid king who jealously guarded power and ruled in a changeable and arbitrary manner, and was soon threatened by his nephew, Arthur of Brittany, who had gained a support base in Normandy, headed primarily in the city of Le Mans. A mark of the new king's weakness was demonstrated with the Treaty of Le Goulet in May 1200, when John accepted Philip as the ruler of all continental Angevin land and paid him 20,000 marks as a mark of submission. He also married Isabella of Angoulême in August 1200, a decision which caused a rebellion from Hugh of Lusignan, to whom Isabella had previously been betrothed. Philip took advantage of the rebellion as a chance to defeat John and formally banned him from Angevin continental lands in April 1202, using his authority gained under the Treaty of Le Goulet to crown Arthur as king on the continent. Philip subsequently launched an invasion of Normandy and made a swift advance into the region, reaching the major royal castle of Arc, which was in territory guarded by William Marshall and the Earl of Salisbury, William Longsword. Philip attacked the castle on the 20th of July, and his forces were met with skirmishing attacks from the Earl's sizable army, which remained behind the city. Meanwhile, the aged Eleanor of Aquitaine had become besieged in her castle at Mebo, which John relieved with great speed and ferocity, the greatest victory of his career. Meanwhile, William and Longsword had also claimed victory and retired to Rouen to celebrate their halting of Philip's advance into Normandy. John now had 250 valuable hostages, including Arthur of Brittany, although John's popularity once again spiralled downward after it emerged that he had starved many of his prisoners to death. This merciless behaviour caused a public scandal, and a number of knights and nobles switched sides to support Philip upon hearing the news, and John soon lost control of Anjou, Maine, and Touraine. But shortly after this, Arthur of Brittany disappeared. June 1203 saw Philip launch a massive and devastating assault on the remnants of Angevin land in Normandy, and quickly capture the left bank of the Seine, after the forces at John's fortresses simply gave up. William attempted to lead an attack against Capetian positions at Vaudreuil, but this led to nothing when his army failed to adequately coordinate their crossing of the River Seine, causing a crushing blow to the Angevin war effort. John grew increasingly paranoid that his own barons would hand him over to the French and retreated from the continent in December 1203. The following May of 1204 saw John send William to Normandy as part of a diplomatic mission to secure property and estates, which were only given by Philip on the condition that William accept him as liege lord on this side of the sea, an oath of great significance. William was fearful that John would be enraged at the depth of this oath to Philip, and worked up a speech designed to break the news gently to the king, although upon his return, he found that an aide had already informed John of this pledge, leaving him furious at Marshall. By June 1205, his actions in France had left William distanced from John's court, which was exacerbated when William refused to fight for John in France on account of his pledge to Philip, a move which led to the entire offensive being called off. William was forced to hand over his firstborn son to the paranoid king as a show of his loyalty, and barely managed to cling on to his position as a consequence. From 1206, William realised that his isolation in John's court prevented him from greater empowerment in the East, and turned his gaze instead toward the West, to Ireland and Wales. William held claims to Pembrokeshire in Wales and Leinster in Ireland through his marriage to Isabel of Clare, and had cemented his position of power in the former by commissioning an expensive new structure, the Round Keep at Pembroke Castle. His sights were turned on Ireland and he requested permission from John to travel there in late 1206, which was granted in February 1207. However, John's fickle nature soon prompted him to change his mind, and he ordered William not to travel to Ireland. But despite his clear instruction, William disobeyed. John's wrath was soon felt, and William lost all control over his fortresses in the Welsh region of Carmarthenshire, and when he arrived in Ireland, William was subject to the oversight of Mela Fitzhenry, the king's lieutenant and an ardent loyalist. Fitzhenry had many enemies in Ireland, and Marshall rallied support from them by authoring a petition, which was signed en masse, requesting that Fitzhenry be returned to England. William had truly tried the king's patience, and was called back to England to face John at a conference in late summer 1207. 
Marshall knew that his lands could be attacked in his absence, and he delivered an impassioned speech to his wife and staff, encouraging them to remain standing in the event of any such action from the king. His castle refortified, and his household briefed. William set off for England on the 27th of September, 1207, to meet with John, who betrayed him as William had feared, ordering that his land be seized and split between various nobles in Ireland. William was kept under arrest in John's court, unable to return to Ireland, and Fitzhenry was ordered to seize the Marshal's Irish territory from January 1208, and in late January 1208, John gleefully informed William that his lands had been attacked, and that his most trusted aide, John of Early, had been killed in the defence. In reality, this was untrue, as in his absence, Marshal's wife Isabel had launched a gallant defence of her land. King John attempted to breach the defence by issuing a powerful order, a royal summons, to force William's knights to leave their posts and travel to England, making them face a difficult choice of loyalty. William's retinue stood bravely on the side of their master, with John of Early leading them, stating that they had no desire to lose the love of our lord. The retinue joined forces with another rebel baron, Earl Hugh of Lacey, and attacked the king's positions in Leinster with resounding success. Defeat at the hands of the barons in Ireland incensed John, and he was forced to call a conference at Bristol in March 1208, at which he freed William, on the condition that the marshals swear loyalty to him as the single ruler of Angevin land. John took another of William's sons, Richard, as insurance for this pledge, which his mother, Isabel, decried as a villainous request. William returned to Ireland a hero, who had stood up to the king and won, although despite this, Marshall remained one of the greatest members of the nobility, and the closest thing John had to a friend, within his increasingly antagonistic band of barons. By 1212, John had fallen far from grace with the nobility, as a consequence of his ineptitude against the French, his poor maintenance of patronage, his demands for increased taxation and military service, as well as his embattlement against the church, which had actually led to his excommunication in 1209. August 1212 saw the crisis at its greatest height, initiated with an insurrection launched against the king in Wales, forcing John to divert his assembled army which he had intended to deploy in France against Philip. John was then informed of a rumour that he was to be overthrown by members of his own retinue, and responded by placing his son and heir, Henry, under a sizeable armed guard. William Marshall demonstrated his loyalty when he managed to convince 26 Irish nobles to sign a pledge of allegiance to John. This action, as well as the sustained support of the marshal, meant a great deal to the now desperate king, who ordered that William be fully readmitted to the fold, and be refurnished with all his lost land, as well as additional holdings in Haverford and the Gower Peninsula in Wales. By early spring 1213, Pope Innocent III had commanded Philip to invade England, and had therefore initiated what amounted to a crusade against the remnants of the Angevin kingdom. This was a move which threatened all-out war, and William was commanded, alongside other nobles, to gather troops into a massive army in Kent as a precaution, whilst he entered into negotiations with the papal legate, Pandulf, in a Templar meeting house near Dover. John once again pledged subservience, and declared that Innocent III was his liege lord, in effect turning England into a papal state, in turn leading to John's readmittance to the church by none other than his detested archbishop, Stephen Langton. In early 1214, John launched a coalition invasion of Capetian land in Normandy, Aquitaine and France, alongside Emperor Otto IV of the Holy Roman Empire, which, despite initial success, soon became blocked in the south, and eventually failed. This was the final nail in the coffin for John's existing regime, and evidenced his lack of power as a ruler, which was made worse by the glory of his forefathers, and was a failure which sparked rebel movements all over England. Despite this, John was joined by military grandees such as William Marshall and William Longsword, although it was evident to all that the balance of power was tilting away from the crown, and so preparations were made for a civil war. But a last-ditched attempt at negotiations, beginning in January 1215, brought forth a significant document, the Magna Carta. The 67-year-old Marshal was John's chief negotiator at these deliberations for the first half of the year. He was the perfect choice, as his status and achievements made him a well-respected and well-liked figure on both sides. And although negotiations began in an ill-tempered manner, 
William and the rebel barons managed to come to an agreement by June 1215, with the production of the first Magna Carta on the 15th. William Marshall, Earl of Pembroke, is the first name listed on the Great Charter after those of the clergy, and demonstrates his significance as a loyal subject and advisor to the king. The document was initially accepted by the barons, marked by their laying down of arms on the 19th of June. The Magna Carta severely limited the power of the crown, and subjected John to the threat of legal disempowerment in the event that he violated the terms of the charter, which was indeed so strict that even the barons expected this clause to be eventually discounted and ignored. For the remainder of 1215, William stood guard over Wales, and engaged rebels in conflict over land in Gower, Carmarthen and Pembrokeshire, and was ultimately unable to prevent territory being lost. But John did have some success in the south, and was widely noted for the brutality which his forces demonstrated in combat. The rebel barons felt cornered by this sudden royal onslaught, and decided to employ the services of Prince Louis of France, to whom the English crown was offered in the event of John's overthrow. Louis arrived in January, and such was the success of his advance that by the summer of 1216, much of northern and eastern England backed the French challenger, with two-thirds of John's nobility turning against him. William Marshall remained by the king's side, although was shocked by news of John's death on the 18th of October, caused by dysentery contracted on the battlefield. John's son Henry was earmarked to gain the crown, although remained unable to take control on his own, due to his tender age of only nine years. After John's burial at Worcester Cathedral, William went to meet the heir to the throne, who was so small he had to be carried by one of his knights, subsequent to which Marshall proclaimed his sustained support for the Angevins. Henry's coronation had to be performed at Gloucester Cathedral, since access to Westminster Abbey remained in territory held by the enemy. Henry was crowned King Henry III on the 28th of October 1216, and William was offered command of the king's armies, which he accepted. In 1216, a new Magna Carta was issued, with 40 clauses rather than 63. The new document omitted some of the more radical clauses, including those unfavourable towards the papacy, and bore the seal of William Marshall, guardian of the realm. This new charter was designed to increase support for the royalist cause, although ultimately had little effect. The year of 1217 brought better fortune for the royalists, and reached an apex at the Battle of Lincoln in late spring, which was to be William's last. This was one of the most stunning victories in English history, and led to the end of the entire conflict, Louis immediately breaking off his siege of Dover Castle upon hearing the news of his army's defeat, and arranging terms of peace with William and Henry III on the 13th of June. Louis was evidently ashamed of his capitulation, and attempted another invasion in July, but he was soon defeated at the Battle of Sandwich by the military hero and head of the Dover defence, Hubert de Burr. Peace talks were held in August 1217, and lenient terms were agreed between both sides on the 28th. William's victory at Lincoln had saved the kingdom from the French, and he was hailed as a hero of almost mythical status. William remained the guardian of the realm, and was now tasked with the reconstruction of England, which had been battered beyond recognition after years of war and siege. Marshall did what he could, by redrafting a new Magna Carta in November 1217, and beginning the restoration of financial and judicial systems throughout the kingdom. However, the task took its toll, and William fell ill in January 1219, riding to the Tower of London to resign his position in March of the same year. John of Early tended to his master, and arranged for him to travel to his country home in Caversham, after which William performed his last state duty from his bed, which was to select the papal legate Pandolf to succeed him. Marshall called the boy king, Henry III, to his bedside, and wished him well in office counselling him not to follow in the footsteps of his father. In his final days, William was joined by his retinue of knights, who loyally kept a constant vigil over their master, helping to ease his pain throughout the night. Marshall died on Tuesday the 14th of May 1219, comforted by John of Early, who rushed to call William's family after he began to fade. His last act to his beloved retinue of knights was a gift of a fine scarlet cloak to each of them, a badge of honour for their service at his side. 
After a long funeral procession into London, William Marshall was laid to rest at Temple Church in London, covered by cloths he had purchased in Jerusalem after burying his friend, Henry the Young King. William Marshall was hailed as the greatest knight to be found in all the world by Stephen Langton, who presided over his funeral in Westminster Abbey. Marshall is remembered as a legendary figure, a master of chivalry and a profoundly talented knight, as well as vastly proficient as a political and military leader. He is noted particularly for his loyalty, remaining by the side of all his masters, until they either perished or were defeated, and he inspired his own retinue and staff to do the same. Historical interest in William Marshall has only recently been revived, although it seems evident that during this golden age of chivalry, Langton's assertion that William Marshall was the world's greatest knight remains true to this day. What do you think of William Marshall? Was Langton right to call him the world's greatest knight? Please let us know what you think in the comment section, and in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. We would like to draw your attention to our revamped Patreon, Subscribestar, and Buy Me A Coffee membership pages, which contain rewards and perks, such as early access to our content, merchandise discounts, and audio versions of our videos, along with much more that we give to our valued supporters. If you have not yet signed up to help our cause, we'd like to ask you to please consider doing so, as we need to secure the channel by safeguarding it from possible demonetization, and also invest in better equipment, software, and more people to help us improve our videos going forward. In short, without your contributions, these videos would not be possible. So if you would like to ensure this channel never has to shut down due to demonetization, please spare whatever you can per month and become People Profiles patrons. Thanks for listening.